from Bob uh, Blancato. Uh, Bob uh, serves as a national uh, coordinator of the bipartisan 3000 member Elder Justice Coalition, the executive director of the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Programs, and national coordinator of the Defeat Malnutrition Today Coalition. Uh, um, uh, Bob is gonna talk about the pandemic, older adult nutrition and the outlook ahead. Uh, Bob? I'd say it's an honor for me to be back invited to your day on Capitol Hill. It's my annual chance to pay tribute to my friend, a great advocate and a really a legend in association leadership, my friend Millicent Gorman. And let me add, happy Black History Month, coming the month after an especially historic month in which we celebrated Kamala Harris becoming the first African-American vice president, Raphael Warnock, the first African-American senator from Georgia, Lloyd Austin, the first African-American secretary of defense. And I would note just yesterday, the new Senate majority leader, Chuck Schumer, named Sanseria Berry to be the first African-American secretary of the Senate. But I come to you today in my capacity as the national coordinator of the Defeat Malnutrition Today Coalition, which is now 107 members strong. I'm proud to say that NBNA has been there from the start, not just as a member, but as an association contributing to our effort to focus needed attention on the problem of malnutrition and older adults. I'm very grateful for the re recent resolution you passed on the subject. It was very thorough and persuasive and helps the larger advocacy cause immensely. So why malnutrition? The reason, we are, the reason that we are all part of the Defeat Malnutrition Today Coalition is to continue to raise awareness and achieve policy changes to address this fundamental threat to older adult health. Let's go one more on the slides and we'll be up to where we are. We need to focus our efforts on older adults in hospital settings since 54% increase in the likelihood of a readmission occurs within 30 days associated with malnutrition. Only 7% of hospital patients are typically diagnosed with malnutrition. It's also, we wanna focus on the overwhelming majority of older adults who live in our communities. And it's estimated that one of two older adults is at risk of malnutrition. Next slide. It has been a year. What a difference a year makes. It was February 6, 2020. We were all together in a ballroom in Washington, DC. I was there. A month later, maybe earlier for some, our world changed. The pandemic began, the biggest healthcare and economic crisis in a century. But before I go any further, let me salute all of you for your commitment and your dedication and selflessness on the front lines throughout this pandemic. So let me, let's talk about Washington's response to the pandemic, uh, starting in January with the, when the public health emergency was declared. And a lot of activity occurred in May with the passage of the different COVID relief bills. And then you went through a long period of time, too long in my judgment, before we got to December 27th when a fourth supplemental COVID relief package was passed. So with nutrition and vaccines, our work in trying to combat older adult malnutrition takes on additional urgency in this pandemic, particularly now since we have reached the important juncture of having two COVID-19 vaccines available. It is important to re reinforce the importance of physical activity and good nutrition to support vaccine effectiveness. According to a, to be a soon to be released uh, article, good nutrition is critical to immunity and to slow the reduction in immunoscience science, science sense, I had this word I knew I was gonna trouble with, which is tied to old age. Next. Even worse, to make matters even worse, COVID-19 has likely further compounded malnutrition risk for older adults for several reasons. Intensification of social isolation, continued disparities, and lack of nutrition security. So health nutrition, and COVID-19. On the health side of this pandemic, of course, is the horrible death toll. It's been mentioned, I'm sure, a number of times. Currently, more than 433,000 individuals. And within that, the disproportionate fatalities among all minority groups and older adults, with African-Americans dying 65 to 74, dying five times as often as white Americans. Same thing was in the 75 to 84 age group, and even 85 and above, black seniors dying twice as often. 
And then, of course, the unmistakable tie between underlying health conditions and COVID-19, some of which were chronic diseases which could have been prevented or slowed through better nutrition. Centers for Disease Control says African-Americans are 40% more likely than non-Hispanic whites to have high blood pressure and less likely to have this under control. And then, of course, the rate of diabetes is 77% higher among African-Americans than among whites. But the issue of vaccine dissemination is front and center at this point in our nation. And while we celebrate the remarkable, and I mean remarkable development, and I commend Pfizer for their tremendous work in this, we have great consternation over the vaccine dissemination process. Here we must confront a new issue of inequity. African-Americans and other minorities are getting vaccinated at a percentage rate significantly lower than their share of the population. I give one example. In the state of Ohio, 13% of the total population is African-American, but their percentage of the vaccination population is 6%. And over 30 states are not even keeping data by race and ethnicity. This must be addressed and making sure we're using all available resources in our community to help, including our aging network. And then, of course, another clear and present consequence of the pandemic is a marked decrease in nutrition security for millions of Americans of all ages. Food insecurity rates have doubled in many parts of our nation. And while data is scarce at the moment, we do expect to find increased rates of malnutrition from this pandemic, and we will be exploring ways to get that data. And food insecurity, you know, while only 3% of all counties have a population that is majority black, according to Feeding America, 18 of 25 counties projected to have the highest 2020 food insecurity rates are majority black. Prior to this pandemic, 15% of older, older African Americans and 14.8% of older Hispanics were food insecure, only 6.2% of white older adults. And, you know, the, the Congressional Black Caucus Institute, Nobel Women, your organization of all published items related to malnutrition in older adults of color. And Nobel said in their resolution from 2019, quote, African-Americans are more than twice as likely to experience nutrition neglect, end of quote. And of course, according to a 2019 study of adult day participants, 65% of black older adults were at high nutritional risk compared to whites and Hispanics. And demand is high in this pandemic. We see the demand for this, the SNAP or the food stamp program growing faster than resources. We have seen a 17% increase in SNAP enrollees just from February to September. And benefits amount, benefit amounts are 15% higher as a result of COVID relief bills being passed. Also, the Older Americans Act nutrition program, which was once both a congregate and a home delivered meal program, is now a completely home delivered meal program with tremendous increase in demand with that. And we look at these circumstances as we continue to endure the pandemic, but we fear the downstream issues. But there are some positive developments that have occurred so far in this pandemic, thanks to the work of Congress and the administration. Almost $1 billion in emergency funding has been provided just to the Older Americans Act nutrition programs during the pandemic. Yet the need is still there for more because believe it or not, that money is running out in many parts of the country right now. So we need to get more supplemental funding into these programs. The second positive development is the increase in use of telehealth in our nation. And the impact from the nutrition perspective has been, has been significant. And we, the goal now is to make telehealth more permanent, but also at the same time improve access so everybody has the ability to do telehealth and telemedicine. And we want to see going forward how telehealth can be used to screen for malnutrition. Since we last met, of course, we've had the election. The 2020 election has happened and the history, as I talked about, of the new vice president and also her important support as a senator of many health care programs in the Senate. Also, since we last met in the administration, we have new administration appointments of relevance to our area, including the pending nomination uh, confirmation of the Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, uh, the current Attorney General of California, Javier Becerra, and the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, who actually will be coming back to that position. He was in that role in the Obama-Biden years, and his confirmation is almost uh, done. You know, and the President said he is confronting four crises simultaneously. 
the pandemic, the economic collapse tied to the pandemic, racial justice, and climate change. And nutrition-related issues are part of all four of these, and some of our agenda of the Defeat Malnutrition Today Coalition will be guided by addressing those crises. Now, since we last met, the Senate has also flipped in terms of the Democrats have officially become the majority in the Senate. And that leads to changes in committee chairmanships that are important to our cause, leading with Senator Patty Murray chairing the Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, Senator Stabenow chairing the Agriculture Committee, Senator Leahy chairing the, the Appropriations Committee, Senator Wyden, the Finance Committee, which deals with Medicare and Medicaid, and Senator Casey now being the chair of the Senate Special Committee on Aging. Now in the House, the leadership of the House is still intact, but we have some committee chairs to, to note. Uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut, a tremendous champion of issues related to nutrition and health, is now the chair of the full House Appropriations Committee. And Congressman Sanford Bishop of Georgia is now the chair of the House Agriculture Committee, and again, the first African-American in that position, and we look forward to working with him going forward. Now, since we last met, there's been a passage uh, and signing into law of a five-year renewal of the Older Americans Act with two more important provisions. One, to allow first-time malnutrition screening to be done in the Older Americans Act, and to adding reducing malnutrition as one of the purposes of the nutrition program. But the pandemic, of course, became a big issue just as this Older Americans Act was signed back in March. So malnutrition has been a little, has been a little bit slow to roll out. But also since we last met, the 2025 dietary guidelines were released at the end of December. And our coalition is involved in various degrees of advocacy in filing written comments, presenting to their advisory committee and conducting meetings with various agency personnel. And as a result, mentions of malnutrition and sarcopenia were included in a new first time chapter focusing on older adults in the dietary guidelines. And they also note that, quote, consuming enough protein is important to prevent the loss of lean muscle mass that occurs naturally with age, unquote, a point we have made any number of times on, in our comments. Also, since we last met, we've had malnutrition awareness resolution passed by the Senate of the United States, a resolution that was authored by Senator Grassley of Iowa and Senator Murphy, a bipartisan resolution with uh, with these co-sponsors that you can see. And I, and I point this out because with the exception of Senator Roberts of Kansas, who did not seek re-election, all these members of Senate members are back. Their co-sponsorship of this resolution indicates that they will be helpful and interested in issues around malnutrition. And we plan to do a lot of work with these members and hope you can join us with that. Looking ahead, we plan to be updating this year our state legislative toolkit to help us get more state legislative action around malnutrition. We're very pleased at the state level response last year, but we know we can do better and we ask for your help. And if you look at this map, you can get an idea of, you know, where malnutrition awareness resolutions proclamations were adopted, um, you know, where state agencies uh, promoting malnutrition. Um, we would like to see this map fuller uh, in 2021. We'd like to see more actual legislative commissions formed to look into setting up state plans for malnutrition awareness. And we look forward to working with NBNA on that very thing. We also have plans to release a new federal legislative toolkit. And we're gonna, we plan to work with you and others to, get, to give proper attention to malnutrition during National Nutrition Month, which is next month in March. We will be working for full implementation of the Older Americans Act malnutrition screening language. We, of course, will be continuing to fight for more money, emergency money and regular money. And we look forward to our work together on Malnutrition Awareness Week. A very important priority to both our associations, uh, and this is where NBNA has been very helpful to us, we want to see critical priority given to get Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to approve a composite malnutrition quality measure. We're very pleased that some progress has been made on that front. It is now, that composite measure is now under the measures of under consideration list, uh, and it has been approved conditionally by the Measure Application Partnership Committee, which is a step toward the CMS approval. The next step is a national quality forum 
must be in, uh, must approve and go forward. And then it will be then when the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, if the NQF approves, they'll make a final decision. And that is where we need to work closely with NBNA on communicating with CMS on the importance of this quality measure. So what can you do? Well, obviously lending your critical voice to getting CMS to approve the composite measure is gonna be front and center for us. And that could be start as early as late uh, this month or early next month. We want your help in helping us recruit more professional nursing organizations, especially the American Nurses Association. We want you to use our resources including our toolkits and our COVID-19 website. We want to work with us, have you work with us on the new administration and the Congress to find new champions. You know how important that is in advocacy, finding your champions, Republicans or Democrats, who's gonna help you advance your legislative agenda. Support our efforts to compile needed data on older adult malnutrition. This is very critical right now, especially in a time of a pandemic. We need to know what the impact has been in that space and support our efforts to ensure emergency funding for all older adult nutrition programs. So I will leave with on the screen a, a resource page. Uh, it can give you further information on a number of things I spoke about. Uh, but again, I wanna tell you how, how uh, appreciative I am and have been over the years to be able to come and address your Capitol Hill Day. I appreciate the partnership we enjoy with NBNA in our efforts to combat older adult malnutrition. And with that, I will say thank you. Thank you, Bob, uh, for your support from year to year um, in the important information that you bring us and the updates you bring us each year. We truly appreciate it here at MBNA, and we look forward to uh, having you back again next year. My pleasure. <laughs>